You know her best from the Norwegian version of Frozen and Frozen 2, but you may know her best as playing Sophie Sheridan in the original company of Mamma Mia. Please welcome Lisa Stucke on My World with Stories podcast. Thank you. So how did you get into like performing and then like where you are now? Wow, that's a big question. <laughs> um, well, you know, I when when I was little, I just always loved uh, entertaining people. I think I realized very, very young that yeah, it was something I enjoyed. I loved seeing people's faces light up. So uh, in fact, the first time I think my parents realized what I was like was we were in the former Yugoslavia, which is now Bosnia and other countries. And um, we were in a restaurant and some people were playing the, the fiddle and an accordion. And I just started to dance in the restaurant and sing along to their music. And then people started to applaud, you know, and, and I was like, wow, this is amazing. And I, I can't have been more than like four years old or something. So from about four years old, <laughs> I think, you know, it started to become a, a real thing. And then my parents sent me to ballet and piano lessons and singing lessons and, and choir and just everything that was in my city that I could get my hands on, I was doing. Um, and I, I grew up in a very small city in the north of Norway called Tromsø, which is above the Arctic Circle. There's only about 70,000 people who live there, um, probably less when I grew up. And, um, but it was great because I got to go to all these things and watch all the shows that would tour through my city. Um, and then I went to um, like a music high school, uh, which was, that was really when I started to get really serious about it, I guess. So when I was about 16 um, and it just kind of went from there. And then I I got a place at the Liverpool Institute for Performing Arts where I did my bachelor degree in acting. Um, Yeah, so. Was your West End debut Mamma Mia or was it something completely different like Yes. And in fact, it wasn't just my West End debut. It was my professional debut. So I went straight from university into a leading role in the West End, which was kind of unheard of. So that was a proper baptism of fire. I had to learn a lot on the job because it's very different studying, you know, performing arts and performing with your peers to actually being in a professional show. Um, That was, and, and the West End is, the highest level it's like broadway so you can't be at any higher level than that there's nothing bigger so yeah it was it was it was a huge learning curve for me but so exciting um i know that you originated sophie like in mama mia nobody else kind of originated it but you um how did that whole process go from like point a to point b Okay, so um, I was living in London and auditioning to everything I could and and working as a waitress uh, at the same time. And I was actually at a audition for the musical called Starlet Express, the the rolling skating musical. And, um, And my singing went great, but my dancing was atrocious because it was real sort of body popping kind of dancing, not really what I had trained in. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, this is a disaster. This has gone so badly. And the casting director though, had kind of seen something, I guess, in me when when I was singing and performing. And so he called me in for an audition for Mamma Mia. And at the time, of course, nobody knew what it was, except that it was an ABBA musical because it was new. 
And um, I love ABBA. So I grew up listening to ABBA my entire life. Love them. And, um, I, you know, I started with the normal audition. So he called me in for a Mamma Mia audition and um, started quite normal with a lot of people, a lot of girls auditioning. And I mean, at the time, even Emma Bundy, who was in Spice Girls, was auditioning for Sophie. So it was like big stars were auditioning for this part and people who had vast experience in the West End and, uh, and TV stars and people like that. And uh, I ended up having eight auditions for that part. So eight different castings, dance auditions, lots of singing auditions. I was working with the pianist. Um, and then as it got further and further along, of course, the, the, the people, there were less and less and less and less people. And at the end, we had our final audition. I remember at the Adelphi Theater where the musical Chicago was playing at the time. And uh, it was just so exciting. You know, we were in a real theater. I was walking past the, the, the doors of Ruthie Henshaw and Uta Lemper who were playing Roxy and, um, oh my gosh, Velma uh, <laughs> at the time. And it was like, oh my gosh, this is so crazy. You know, I was, I had seen the show and there they were. And um, yeah. And then after the audition, my last audition, uh, I remember they, cause I was last, I was one of the last people auditioning and Phyllida Lloyd, the director came over to me afterwards. And she just kind of put her hand on my shoulder and she went, I'll see you soon. And I was like, Oh, oh my gosh, is this a sign? Does this mean, do I have it? You know? <laughs> It was crazy. And then my, um, uh, a few days later, I think my agent called me at my waitressing job and he said, uh, you got the part of Sophie. And I was like, what? Cause I thought at this point that I was realistically looking at ensemble, right? I didn't think, or understudy or something. I didn't think that they would actually give me the part. And I said, no, 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 that can't be right that's a mistake. Someone's like pulling your leg. So I, I went to his office and I made him call the casting director, David Brenrod, to tell me in person. And like, what was it like bringing that character off the page and kind of like playing her every day? <laughs> well, you know, we had a long rehearsal process because it was a new show. So you kind of, it works very differently to when you take over a role. So I've done both with different kinds of shows, but this is the only show I've ever done that was original. And it is so exciting because you are part of the process. So, you know, that was what was so groundbreaking, you know, with um, Hamilton was that Lin-Manuel Miranda recognized that the cast themselves were actually part of creating the show. So they were the first cast in the world to ever have royalties on the success of the show forever, which is amazing. But of course, you know, Mamma Mia is 22 years ago. We didn't have that then, but, but we were part of creating the show. So Katherine Johnston had written a phenomenal script, really great script. But of course, when you work on a show like this, you all have to work on it together. So it's very different taking a script that's never been performed um, and you have to kind of make it come alive, right? So we were kind of creating as we were going along. So it was very hard rehearsals, long days. I remember there was a, there was a, a time when, um, when uh, Philida wanted Sophie to play the guitar, which is how the show is now. So they wanted her to have a guitar and thank you for the music. And I remember I was just like having a panic attack. I was like, I cannot <laughs> learn anymore. Like this is so, so unfortunately you know I should have done it anyway even though it was hard but in my show she wasn't playing the guitar yet so it was just the thought of having to learn that on top of everything else was just because we were working such crazy days um but it was uh it was just wonderful and then yeah that was about a two-month process uh where we worked like this we were rehearsing doing choreography. The craziest thing was that, you know, for, for people who were in London and who came to see the previews, you know, previews are two weeks before your opening. So you're doing, a. I think we did, I can't remember if we did 
six weeks rehearsal, two weeks previous, or if we did eight weeks rehearsal and two weeks previous, I can't quite remember. But when the previews happened, the original show opens with Summer Night City, which isn't in the show anymore, right? So it didn't open with I Have a Dream. It opened with this crazy chair choreography number uh, <laughs> where wedding gifts were coming in and out of the, of the space. So like preparing for the wedding, that was the start of the show. And we had rehearsed this choreography for two months. It was you know, so complicated and it kept changing every day. And literally during previews, they realized this isn't working. Mm. So what we'd been working on relentlessly, probably spending the most time on that one number. Um, and suddenly they just went, we have some news <laughs> and they just cut the number and we were quite shocked, but it was totally the right decision. You know, it, it's so much better for opening completely differently to how any West End show or Broadway show opened at the time. So we did the opposite. Every show, as you know, probably has a big overture and then it goes into kind of bang, you're in, right? Yeah. And Mamma Mia does the opposite. And I think that is so cool. And it was, yeah, very exciting to be standing there alone opening the show on opening night. Would you ever go back and do it again? Oh my gosh, I would love to. You know, I'm uh, I'm 46 now. Okay, so I am um, I am older than Siobhan McCarthy, who played Donna when I played Sophie, which is nuts. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I would love to go in and play Donna one day. That would just be so full circle, very fun. Mm -hmm. I'd love that. What was that um, opening night like? Because like there were so many people there and like you had Benny and Bjorn there. What was that like? It was a, to be honest, it's almost like a blur because it was so, <laughs> we had worked so hard up to this moment. And obviously once you do that show, whatever the critics say is so out of your control you know, you can't do anything about how the show is received. And even though we had had really good feedback from the audience, uh, because we hadn't realized this was a comedy, by the way, until we got the audience in for the previews, we thought we were making a much more kind of worthy and serious show. But then people started laughing and we were like, oh my gosh, they are laughing. And then everything changed. All the seasoned actors like turned straight into you know, I know what to do with this. And, <laughs> and, you know, the timings would change because you would wait for a laugh. And, and so by the time we got to opening night, um, we, we thought it would be received well, but we just didn't know. So we just had to do what we had been told to do. And I kind of, um, I remember when, when the curtain went up and I just kind of told myself, I was like, this is it, just do the show like you're supposed to do the show and just, you know, uh, do your best and then we'll see. And, and I just kind of had to blank out the fact that so many, you know, stars that I admire were in the audience, you know, people who were top of their craft, like top of their uh, profession, people I hugely admired were there. And working with Benny and Bjorn was, was, such an honor. I mean, they're my musical heroes. I love ABBA to this day. I It's the music, you know, I just adore singing ABBA songs. Uh, I, I still actually sing ABBA songs in my car. Like that's how sad I am. I, <laughs> I actually love listening to their songs, not just the Mamma Mia music really so much, uh, although I love those too, but I love some of their other songs, but I digress. Anyway, the um, experience was really magical, really magical. And uh, yeah, I just felt relieved actually when it was over because there was just so much pressure, you know? Um, and luckily the reviews were great and people loved the show and yeah, standing ovations every night for a year. That's just insane. Mm -hmm. You know, I think what is so wonderful about Mamma Mia is that people realized the depth of the lyrics of ABBA. Cause I think everyone just thought they were just disco music but they hadn't really been listening to the words. Yeah. And there's, there's just 
you know, like the winner takes it all is one of the best songs ever written, I think, uh, of any music. It's so beautiful. So did um, Guys and Dolls, if I'm correct? Um, yeah. What was that experience like? Oh, wow. Well, I Guys and Dolls is, yeah, it's probably, it's one of my favorite roles to have ever played and one of my favorite ever shows that I've done. I really loved it so much. I could have played Sarah Brown until the day I die. That part is so beautiful. Um, I just, oh gosh, I just loved it so much. So I, I first did the tour. So we toured around the UK where I live. Um, and, you know, when you get to tour, it's quite special because you obviously you, you travel around meeting local people. Um, and I had never done a tour before. So it was a real again, a big learning experience for me. Uh, but we had a fantastic cast, cast and crew, and just, yeah, a lovely bunch of people and so much fun. And then it transferred to London. This is one of my favorite things. Okay, so when I auditioned for Guys and Dolls, mm -hmm. um, Patrick Swayze was playing Nathan Detroit in mm -hmm. London. And I love Patrick Swayze. I grew up literally fangirling over him. And his wife was called Lisa. She's from Finland. And uh, see, I know these weird facts about Patrick Swayze because I really was such a fan and loved Dirty Dancing. It's one of my favorite films. So when I auditioned for this part, I was waiting outside, in, outside, outside in London. And who comes out but Patrick Swayze by himself? <laughs> you know, comes out. And I'm like, you know, and it, there's this awkward silence because obviously I know fine well who he is. It's Patrick Swayze. I honestly had one of those, I carried a watermelon moment where I was like, hi. <laughs> and it just started a conversation and he was so lovely. And, you know, it wasn't a big conversation, but it was just, it was just such a wonderful moment. So then when I went in, I felt as high as a kite and I got that job, right? So mm -hmm. it, it was great. And so when I went into London, unfortunately, by that point, he was already ill. I didn't know that, but he was already very, very sick. He was um, uh, replaced by Don Johnson took over. So when I played there, it was Don Johnson who was in Miami Vice and a huge fan of his as well. And he is, he is so funny, very funny guy. Um, he was very sweet to me and, um, yeah, and it was just, again, one of those privileged moments, um, just beautiful music, wonderful people, a fun role. You know, I got to kind of like fall in love every night, you know, just super fun. Mm -hmm. And yeah, I, that's. I wish I could play that part again, but I'm a little too old now. <laughs> so I'm going to leave that to other people. But it, that was one of the best moments of my life. What was Frozen like? How did you get involved into voice acting? Yeah. Right. So kind of similar to Mamma Mia in, in many ways. This has happened to me so many times where I was doing a, a different show. So I was doing Annie the Musical in Norway, actually. So I was playing Grace Farrell. And um, somehow the Norwegian dubbing studio that obviously had been given the job of casting Frozen, they invited me for an audition. Now I have never met those people. I have never spoken to them. Um, and I don't know how it came about that they thought about me because I have no experience in voice acting. And it is a field I have always wanted to get into, but I didn't know how. Uh, how I would go about that. Now I know that, but um, I didn't at the time. And I am obsessed with Disney. I mean, sort of like how you were with Mamma Mia. I grew up, I've watched, you know, all the Disney movies. I have sung all the songs my entire life. Absolutely love them. You know, um, Alan Menken and Howard Ashman, you know, uh, Robert and Richard Sherman. Um, so yeah, I'm a complete Disney freak. And um, so when the call came, can you come in an audition for Frozen? And at the time it was for Anna actually. Um, 
I was freaking out. I was like, are you kidding me? I could not believe it. I was so excited. Probably the most excited I've, apart from Mamma Mia, but it was just honestly like a dream come true. And I went into audition for Anna. And um, by the time I auditioned for Anna, which is a, you know, I think it's actually a harder part in many ways. It's such a you know, beautiful role. Uh, my my friend who who plays it, uh, Mike Christine Crispus, and she's phenomenal as Anna. But at the time, I had done my research about Frozen, and I read that Idina Menzel was going to play Elsa, and I was like, hmm, I bet they're going to write her an amazing song because there's no way they're going to hire Idina and not write her the Oscar song. So I thought. I want to play Elsa. Um, and I asked and they said no <laughs> because they had already finished that audition loop. So they had already finished that process. They hadn't actually cast anyone yet, but they were sent off to Disney for approval. So I was like, okay, well, if something happens and you can't you know, find her, I would really, really like to audition for her. And uh, a few weeks later, I had still not heard back from my Anna audition. Um, and, uh, you know, I was still waiting and I get a call and they said, you know, we still don't know about Anna yet because we haven't heard, but, um, we would like you to come and audition for Elsa. And it turned out that all the people that had been submitted for Elsa had been declined by Disney themselves because it's a very complicated process. It goes in a lot, goes into these dubs. And so I did go in and I auditioned for Elsa. And when I heard Let It Go for the first time, I was just freaking out. I was like, I can't believe this is happening to me. I actually get to sing the song. Are you kidding me? I just knew this was special. I could feel it in my bones. I think anyone who got to hear that song before the public got their hands on it knew that this was a special song. It just, it you just know. I went in and I auditioned and the director actually cried in my audition. <laughs> She's like, no one's been able to hit that note before. <laughs> so yeah, that's the long story of how I got to play Elsa. It, it seems like you did Ralph Breaks the Internet. Yes, that's right. What was that process like for that whole movie? Right, so very similar. So I, I was very lucky that when I got cast as Elsa, they have kept me as Elsa for for all the movies or for the Lego movies, the short films like Frozen Fever, but um, all of the different short films. And then when, when Wreck-It Ralph came up, of course it's owned by Disney. Everyone thinks it's Pixar, but it's still Disney. Um, it's a Disney film. And um, so same thing, I just came in and, and, and put my voice to that. And, and it's not actually that film, there's only a few lines in there but they are so funny. I mean, it's it's my favorite scene in all of Wreck-It Ralph, I think. It is the funniest scene with those princesses in there. Mm. What was it like doing Frozen 2 and then going on stage like with Indina Menzel and all that? <laughs> oh my gosh. So, you know, I, I loved recording Frozen 1 I, and I think it's such an impeccable film. It's flawless. I just think it's genius. And then when Frozen 2 came about, I, I think it was extra special just because, you know, I'm originally from Norway. So in fact, my mom's American and, and I grew up in Norway. And the fact that the film is set in my home country and I recognize all of the references, it's really funny, you know, coming from there. Um, obviously it's an animation. So they've exaggerated stereotypes and also they've snuck in some German things and they've snuck in some Swedish things and it's all a little bit of a mishmash. But the second film I thought was really special um, because Disney incorporated the uh, native people of Norway called the Sami. In fact, they're, they're, they're the native people of all of North Europe. So all the Nordic countries and Russia as well. And because this was a big part of this storyline. So they call them the Tundra people, Nor North Aldra, that's what you call them, aren't they? North Aldra, they call them in the Frozen 2, but they're based on the Norwegian Sami people. And because I know a little bit of Norwegian history, and I was obviously, as I was voicing this film, the 
we don't get to see the whole film, by the way. So when you're dubbing, you only get to see the parts relevant for you to do your job. So I would get to see snippets that would have to do with whatever else is reacting to or talking about later. And when I realized the depth of this film, that it just goes so much deeper, I think, um, and deals with a lot of uh, very big themes, you know, like grief and and regret and um, and also um, forgiveness and you know repairing deep deep hereditary wounds, if you will. Um, yeah, I I was just completely amazed with the courage of this film, and I think it passed a lot of critics by. I I, I was like, did did we watch the same film because? Disney just did a very big thing here and no one's picked up on it, um, which I thought was so interesting, you know, coming from Norway and knowing the Norwegian history against the indigenous people. So uh, I felt so proud to be a part of that. And I got to meet with the, um, the people who were actually involved with Disney from all of these countries, uh, the in indigenous people called Sami. Uh, they created a, a group called Varde, which means, I guess, the protectors, um, who were there to make sure Disney were respecting their culture. And I got to meet them and, and it was just, yeah, it, it just felt very, very special, you know, being in Norway. And also my colleague who plays Sami Elsa, she plays the native voice of Elsa. Um, she's amazing. She's called Mariana Penta. So go look her up. She's, she's brilliant. Uh, so I got to, to also uh, meet with her and we got to record a special song. Uh, we got to record um, Into the Unknown in both of our languages together. So you can watch that on my YouTube channel. Uh, it's there. So go check out Into the Unknown with me and Mariana Penta. It's really cool. And that was made by Disney. From Frozen 2 making this film, I thought it would be Show Yourself. Because to me, that's the superior song, personally. I think it's just the most incredible song. Uh, I love Into the Unknown, but there's something about Show Yourself that just got me right in the heart. And uh, one of my friends uh, called Lynette Howell-Taylor, uh, we, we studied together at university at Lippa. She was the producer for the Oscars this year. And she called me up in December and said, listen, um, I'm trying to create something for the Oscars, but you can't tell anyone, but I want to get, um, if, if Into the Unknown is nominated, because they thought it might be, because, you know, Disney submits their songs for nomination, right? So she said, if they're nominated, I would love for there to be an international version on stage like the multi-language let it go do you remember that video when everyone was shown with their yeah and you know i was like oh my gosh this is such a great idea you know because it's international and i think a lot of people in the us maybe don't realize it's translated to 46 languages so if you live in norway or you live in russia or you live in taiwan or you know you're gonna know more of the voice of your local country than you are going to know Edina Menzel. You'll know her too, obviously, but to kids, she's not their Elsa. So um, I just thought this is such a beautiful idea to honor all of these different countries. Well, come January, it was getting very real, you know, that they might be nominated. And I remember being at the airport in Norway and I think this was late January or early February. I think it was late January. And I remember being at the airport watching live the Oscar uh, nomination announcements thinking, come on, please. Because by this point they had chosen the girls they wanted to, to travel. She's like, please nominate them. Because without the nomination, I knew that I wouldn't be going. And of course they were nominated and I was like, oh my gosh. And then we had to wait to see if we all got visas to travel across, which wasn't a given because it was only two weeks between nomination to show. And in those two weeks, we all, all of us frozen girls had to get designer dresses from somewhere uh, to wear. So it was, yeah, it was nuts, but just unforgettable. What is it like doing Frozen and like Mamma Mia, like when like the fan base like what's that 
like like for you? Well, when we did Mamma Mia, it was it was really cool. I mean, we had some lovely people who were there literally every night. And I mean, I'm still in touch with one of my fans actually called Elaine, who is so delightful. And she would be there. I think she watched when I was there. I think she must have watched the show like 200 times. I can't even imagine the cost of watching that show that many times, but she was like a super fan. And, you know, she was just nothing but sweet. I never had any, any problems with anyone being out of order or, or not behaving appropriately. I, that never happened to me. I only had very sweet people who were respectful and, and, and kind and, you know, I, again, I, I'm I'm really in awe of their dedication to the show. I think that's really beautiful. And I would get lovely letters from people, um, you know, and I would try to write back to, to people, but, you know, sometimes there was a lot, so it was, it was hard, but, um, and with Frozen too, you know, it's, it's a lot of little kids and it's, I love that. And, um, you know, I grew up loving Disney. So to know that, I am someone else's, you know, um, like how, how Ariel was to me or, you know, that kind of thing is, is just really humbling. I, I, it's like, it's gone full circle. I almost can't believe that I get to do that. I feel very privileged to do that. Yeah. Yeah. I love it. Although it is very funny with little children because their parents would be like, this is Elsa. And they'll look, take one look at me with my dark hair. And, you know, uh, I look nothing like Elsa. I'm, you know, middle-aged. And they're like, what? What are you talking about? That is clearly not Elsa. <laughs> and then you just look super confused. Um, so yeah, there's that. But um, older kids, obviously, they get the concept. But, you know, being the voice of someone doesn't make any sense to children you know they just think the cartoon is the person so with frozen and mama mia did i know for mama mia you had to do the cast album so what is it like like when people are listening to you sing <laughs> <laughs> I, it's always like i i don't really think about it because you know, I just kind of go in and I do my job and I do my job to the best of my ability because obviously I want people to have the best that I can give them. Uh, and, but, you know, when I do meet with people and like, you know, you with listening to the cast album, I think that's so wonderful. Yeah, it's just really lovely to hear. It's never not nice to hear that people appreciate your work, you know? I can't understand that if people are upset that people say, I love your work and people <laughs> find that upsetting. I don't get that because, you know, we, we do it for other people. You know, it gives me joy, but I think my biggest joy is honestly seeing how much it means to other people. I think that's really nice. Hmm. Thank you. What's next for you? Are you going to continue doing like, I know that you do like ABBA concerts or like, like, are you going to continue doing that? Like, what's... Next? So I have quite a varied career. I've, I've deliberately built up a career where I'm not, you know, putting myself into a small box and just staying within that, that one skill. And, um, you know, so I've done so many different kinds of jobs within musical theater, TV, film. I've done a lot of commercials. Um, and I, you know, now with the voiceover, I really love that. And it's something I, I, I definitely want to push more. I want to get myself a home studio um, and do that kind of thing and work much more in this field. But I'm super excited about, uh, you know, this year has been a challenge. I'm not going to lie. It's been very hard um, not being allowed to do your job. It's almost like I've had to grieve a little bit this year. Because, you know, I, I don't just do a job. I don't just turn up and get my money and go home. I genuinely love what I do. And the thing I love the most is actually, you know, working with other creative people. And also, I love performing because it's so instant. You get to see the reaction in people's eyes straight away. And I love 
um, being able to, to, you know, wake up feelings in other people. I just think it's such a privilege to, to get to do this kind of job. Um, and I love talking to people, you know, after a show and, uh, I, I, I always appreciate so much that people come to hear me sing or, or come to my, you know, my movies like frozen, or they come to my, um, you know, concerts and stuff. It's, it's, I'm really humbled by that, you know? Um, so I just want to continue doing what I've been doing really, because it's been, it's been a lot of fun. You know, it's been, it's, it's a hard job, not doing the actual job. It's more the creating the jobs. It's the, it's the most challenging part doing the actual jobs. It's just, it's a lot of fun, especially if you work with nice people, it's just the best. <laughs> Thank you for doing this with me. I really appreciate it. <laughs> oh, my pleasure, Brooke. And it was so nice to talk to you. And thank you so much, Brooke. I think you're doing a wonderful job. And I wish you all the success in the world with your career. And, <laughs> you know, this is so cool that you're doing this. Thank you so much. Thank you so much for listening and watching to My World with Stories podcast. For more info, go to Instagram and Facebook at My World with Stories podcast and make sure that you give us a like, a subscribe, a follow, whatever you want. Do it because we love you guys so much. And